Time for the third in a series of videos on key scenes from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, aimed at helping you think and work more independently about ideas, characters, language and themes within the play. Don't just listen and nod, answer the questions, make notes, annotate your texts. This will invariably result in a deeper understanding of the play. So stay tuned, let's study Act 1, Scene 5 from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. This is Schofield on Shakespeare. A reminder that you need to have read Act 1, Scene 5 before watching this video. If you haven't, go away and do that now before returning. Time for my brief summary of this longish scene. Well, we have our first introduction to Festy, the all-licensed fool, who under convention is permitted to wittily draw attention to the folly of others, including his mistress Olivia but who has inexplicably been absent for some time. Olivia is initially abrupt following Feste's reappearance, but thaws and defends him against the unkind, self-loving barbs of Malvolio, her steward. Cesario successfully gains entrance to Olivia's house, getting past bouncers Sir Toby and Malvolio in the process. He begins his Orsino penned or at least inspired pre-prepared spiel of love, but Olivia quickly becomes more interested in him than the message he has been instructed to deliver. The scene ends with Olivia hopelessly in love with the spirited young page, gentleman currently in straitened times. She orders Malvolio to run after Cesario once he has left, giving him a ring, which will signify very clearly that the love triangle between Olivia, Viola and Orsino is now complete. Time for you to look at this scene in more detail. Some questions are about to appear on screen. Read these questions through now, grab your pen and aim to write some reasonably detailed answers, including quotations. This video will resume in five seconds time, so press pause now to get started. Question 1. Explore the dynamics between Olivia, Festa and Malvolio in the opening parts of the scene. Well, there's no doubt that Olivia is initially dismissive in her language and attitude towards Feste. Maria has pre-warned Festa that his absence has made Olivia angry, and so her curt imperatives take the fall away and go to are no surprise. Whereas Maria in Act 1, Scene 3 refers to dry jest to hint that Sir Andrew is withered and impotent, here the same adjective is used to suggest that Fester has run dry of jokes and is no longer funny. Tell me, within your edition, is Fester's speech on screen now delivered as a soliloquy or at least partially addressed to Olivia and Malvolio? Within my Cambridge school Shakespeare, Olivia and Malvolio are on stage for this speech, and this makes a subtle difference to the dynamics between them. If Olivia is on stage, then could Fester's opening plea to himself to come up with some witty cracks to put himself into good fooling be interpreted as a gentle message to Olivia to give him a bit of time to return to his previous comic heights? If so, does this imply the basis of a reasonably caring, empathetic relationship between the two? However, looking online, it seems as though in the majority of editions, Olivia enters with Malvolio after this speech, in which case, Fester's words are shared exclusively with the audience. He is asking us to give him good luck as he endeavours to amuse and be clever with his language and puns, which of course is never easy. Fools do need to be adroit when it comes to language, and so Fester's use of 
chiasmus within a quotation from his made-up philosopher gives an early indication of his linguistic dexterity of his recognition of the fact that his role requires him to sound clever and meaningful furthermore his statement is true it is better to have the intelligence implied by the role of a witty fool than to be a foolish wit so there are early signs of Fester's vulnerability and ability with language, and with time he manages to get Olivia back on side by setting up a question and answer sequence which will ultimately confirm his own wit. In this easy to understand exchange, Fester questions Olivia's mourning. He knows the answer to his question but needs her to deliver her line so that he can continue his logical progression which will end in a trap. When she says that she's mourning for her brother's death, Fester gives a provocative answer which he knows that she will contradict. This then leads to Fester being able to boot the ball into an open goal by declaring that Olivia is being foolish for mourning a brother who, according to Christian orthodoxy, is in a much better place. Olivia's response to being out Fox indicates that she is by no means offended and indeed has rather enjoyed this return to form of her fool's wit. Moreover, close analysis of this exchange does point to a natural intuitive synergy between herself and Feste. The use of isocolon, phrases or clauses of equal length, show the pair's language working seamlessly together as they progress towards the inevitable conclusion of their question and answer exchange. Put simply, it seems as though the pair are very much on the same intellectual wavelength. They get each other which is not the case with Malvolio, whose language shows a characteristic misalignment and misjudgment of the situation in which he is involved in. Asked to give his viewpoints, Malvolio's use of the phrase pangs of death jars horribly with the situation, suggesting that he should get more and more foolish like a fool until he dies a painful death doesn't feel like a proportionate fair response to Feste's successful fooling of Olivia. It sounds bitter, it sounds melodramatic and, as Olivia herself says shortly afterwards, confirms that he takes himself too seriously, that he is sick of self-love. Of course, Shakespeare doesn't tend to give much detail in terms of backstories. And so we don't know the extent to which there may be justifiable beef between Malvolio and Feste. However, in the absence of this, the audience can't help but get the impression that Malvolio may be a humorless, unimaginative individual, too keen to judge and put others down. Eliot Krieger, within his essay Malvolio and Class Ideology in Twelfth Night, attempts to defend Malvolio's self-love by comparing it to similar egotistical feelings exhibited by Orsino and Olivia. He argues that it is Malvolio's lower class which, unfairly, makes his self-love seem so much more unpalatable than that demonstrated by his so-called social superiors. Whilst there is some truth in this, clearly the way he is treated in the latter stages of the play leaves modern audiences deeply uncomfortable. Revisiting this scene reminds us that this man is unpleasant, he is judgmental and he's just too conceited to be defended too vigorously. In the 1986 Australian production of the play, Malvolio directs a superior fake laugh in the direction of Feste, as he tries to suggest that, without a positive audience and being given opportunities by others, the fool cannot independently think of anything witty. Feste's facial expression confirms an increasingly intense dislike for this fellow member of Olivia's household, and foreshadows later cruel taunting. Look you now, he's out of his guard already unless you laugh or minister occasion to him. He is gagged. Oh, you are sick of self-love, Malvolio, and taste with a distempered appetite. To be generous, guiltless, and a free disposition is to take those things of a bird bolts that you deem cannon bullets. Question two. How do the descriptions and comments about Cesario before he enters develop our understanding of Viola? Well, irrespective of our own opinion of the actress playing Viola, comments from Mariah and Malvolio confirm Cesario's youthful and attractive appearance. She describes him as a fair young man and well attended, 
so handsome and presumably accompanied by several attendants. However, note the preceding phrase in which Mariah answers that she doesn't know whether Cesario has come from Orsino. This confirms the previous impression we have gained that Viola is no fool, and of course what constitutes being a fool is one of the major themes of the play. In the previous scene the audience saw how well and how quickly Viola had adapted to her disguise and role as Cesario, so much so that she had become Orsino's number one messenger and confidant. And here she shows her nous by refusing to give her name or link herself to Orsino, thus presumably increasing the chances of her gaining admittance. By this stage Olivia must be sick to death of having to fend off Orsino sent messages and messengers. So Toby either refuses to, is sufficiently disinterested by, or simply too drunk to say anything about Cesario other than that he is a gentleman. This however is important given the rigidity of the class structure within Shakespeare's time, which makes Malvolio's later desires to marry Olivia so unpalatable to a contemporary audience, if much less so to modern viewers, Olivia would not be able to contemplate falling in love with Cesario if he were not a gentleman. It is also significant that this gentleman status is confirmed by Sir Toby rather than a mere servant. Whatever else he might be, as Olivia's uncle and possessing a title, he is unquestionably a member of the aristocracy and Olivia's own family. Malvolio's version of his encounter with Cesario at the gates confirms Viola's steadfastness and resilience, a remarkable resilience in the circumstances. Remember that at the end of the previous scene, she revealed that she herself was in love with Orsino and would love to be his wife. Therefore, for her to determinedly and doggedly argue and insist upon an audience with Olivia, with not one, not two, but three members of her household, smacks of extraordinarily selfless devotion to the orders and desires of the man she loves. Indeed, this stands out all the more within a play which, so far, largely seems to feature the self-centred, whether that is Orsino obsessing dreamily about Olivia, Sir Toby using Sir Andrew, or Olivia herself wallowing in her claims of grandiose misery. Or, as Jean Howard memorably phrases it within the orchestration of Twelfth Night, vulnerable she may be, but she is not mired in an emotional bog. On stage, the straight-laced, unimaginative Malvolio's exasperation is likely to be seen as highly comic, and some of the comedy stems from his perplexed cross repetition of the refrain-esque phrase and therefore comes to speak with you. This is known as epistroph, and Malvolio's use of the same phrase mirrors Cesario parroting outside the household's gates. Malvolio goes on to use imagery to suggest an intriguing gender ambiguity about Cesario. His gender seems more fluid, between stages, difficult to pin down. He suggests that Cesario is like an unripe pea pod or an unripe apple just before both come to fruition. The fact that Malvolio goes to the trouble of using two different images to make the same point shows how much of an effect Cesario has had on him. He himself is intrigued. The descriptive phrase, very well favoured, confirms Mariah's point about his unusual handsomeness. Seeing members of her own household entreat and taken with Cesario, it is no wonder that Olivia's own curiosity and rekindled quest for the experiences of change and life means that the dashing young stranger is admitted to her presence. Some critics have commented on the fact that Olivia is virtually an acronym for Viola. To what extent do you feel Shakespeare is aiming to emphasise similarities between the two characters in this screen? An interesting question, because of course there are clear similarities in their situations. Both have, or think they have, lost brothers. Both are in the relatively unusual and potentially precarious position of being a woman having to make her own way in the world without protection from a male family member. Sir Toby may be Olivia's uncle, but in no way can be said to be a helpful or caring guardian. 
both are proud. Viola defiantly refuses Olivia's money towards the end of the scene, rebuking her with the line, I am no feet post lady, keep your purse. But there are very obvious differences between the pair, although some of these may be due to the current precariousness of Viola's position. It could be argued that Viola has to be dogged and resolute in her quest to win Olivia's heart for Orsino. Otherwise, could the latter, having engaged her services presumably on a whimsy, not decide to disengage her equally quickly, leaving her with nowhere else to go? Viola is certainly conscientious and conventional in her initial use of language, aimed at persuading Olivia to consider Orsino's suit. The argument is a familiar one. The most beautiful women have a duty to cave in to male overtures. Else, with no fruitful sex, there will be no beautiful genes passed on to future generations. This argument is aimed at appealing to the ego of the female. Her beauty is so extraordinary that it passes beyond the individual to become a wider responsibility. The same argument is used within the opening sonnets of Shakespeare's sonnet sequence. Sonnet 4 ends with a threatening couplet shown on screen. Da, da, da. So Viola does not start off particularly imaginatively or outside the box as she pleads Orsino's case, although the epitome of conscientiousness she is. Whereas Viola is diligent, Olivia has moments of flippancy. Responding to the tired conventional argument of the moral imperative of passing on her beauty through presumably unsatisfactory sex, she suggests that she will create a detailed bullet point list of her beauty so that it survives in print at least. The brutal dissecting of her beauty into small ordinary body parts such as item two grey eyes with lids to them is comic and amusingly satirical. It is another light-hearted moment of Olivia not taking herself too seriously, also seen in her response to Feste proving her foolishness. Poor Viola can't afford to adapt a glib approach to life. Whereas Olivia can be playful, Viola remains earnest and at times poetically inspired. Sticking rigidly to her task, she declares how she would react to Olivia's inhumane rejection. With these words on screen, we get the impression that Viola is now improvising, is moving away from pre-prepared, perhaps with Orsino, verse. Thus the poetry takes on greater life and verve. The collective personification and echoing cries of the babbling gossip are far more likely to result in an emotional response from Olivia than staid references to the imperative of passing on perfect genes. So here we have a hint of the hidden passion latent within Viola, which is also seen in Act 2, Scene 4, when she tells Orsino of her father's daughter's love for a man which was never revealed. Of course, this passion and emotion has to be suppressed, but overall, by the end of Act 1, it is surely Viola who is coming across as the most attractive, interesting character in the play, not Olivia, and certainly not Orsino. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, encouraging you to think more closely about Act 1, Scene 5 from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Many thanks for watching.